the partial derivative of this uh, gamma i alpha beta coupled stem in, in, uh, to, to this spin density. Now uh, uh, we have this new, and then we have to put this now in a Lagrangian which is covariant under this um, um, after we have introduced the gauge fields. We have to redo the formalism and we have to, um, uh, to, um, uh, to look again how these uh, laws uh, become generalized in the case we have the gauge potentials. Okay? Oh. We do the Lagrangian formalism. We do the Lagrangian formalism. The Lagrangian formalism. With inclusion of the gauge projections. So Wherever we have this, we prepared it already, this D i alpha, the Groninger i alpha, we have to substitute it by E i alpha, or if it's uh, the other way around, in the case of um, um, the frame, um, just the indices uh, interchange, and if we have uh, the partial derivative i, we substitute by this covariant derivative i, which is by definition the partial plus, and now we have this new case potential, gamma i alpha beta times f alpha beta. And, and the earth, and the most interesting thing also from a formalistic point of view is that the, the Lie algebra of the Poincare group gets deformed. This is a unique uh, because gravity is a universal interaction, so it has an exceptional structure also in its gauge uh, uh, manifestation. So if you now do with respect to this uh, gauge uh, translations and uh, with respect to the uh, and, and we do the D algebra for it. This you just substitute it and, and uh, take some formulas from differential geometry, how you differentiate the gamma, and you get a, a, a privilege tensor, et etc. I'm not uh, going to do that, but you it's it's straightforward algebra, you just compute the alpha e beta, the commutator, and so these translations, which are gauged, the gauge translations, don't fulfill the old B e algebra anymore. It's E i alpha, E j beta, and here we have now minus torsion, i j gamma times E gamma plus curvature, R i j um, gamma delta times f gamma delta. This is unique in physics that the Lie algebra in the gauge theory gets deformed. This is what we call a deformed Lie algebra. Just a nice word. And this is also by some mathematicians that have looked into these questions. And, uh, the uh, deformed uh, commutator be between, well, this is uh, the deformation is smooth. You just put here the covariant derivative, you can uh, just uh, uh, compute it straightforwardly. So you get here nothing unexpected, half alpha beta times E gamma commutator, not half, comma. <coughs> G gamma alpha anti-symmetric e beta. So this is this. And the F alpha beta 
f gamma delta der unchanged. So by the translational uh, uh, by the translational gauging, you deform the Lie algebra, and this is not taking place in the Young Mills theory. This is only taking place uh, this. Uh, new um, deformed Lie algebra space so in, in super uh, gravity where you take a square root of a translation as a supersymmetry transformation and they have then corresponding Lie algebras and with commutators and anti-commutators <coughs> and then they have also this deformation process which takes place at, at, as soon as you have a translation or a square root of the translation the supersymmetry uh, transformation. So this is a, a, a quite a fundamental structure, I think, which one uh, needs to uh, understand. <coughs> uh, okay, uh, to cut now a, a long story short, um, we do the Lagrange formalism and we do conservation laws and now I do what one should usually not do. Um, I correct my I just put in in green the new pieces for the translation. Where are my cards? Here. Here these currents. And it's it's very minor. All they get is here an E, E is by definition the determinant of the tetra, E I alpha. They get just here an E, and they get here an E, and they get here a, a gauge covariant derivative, everything else is the same. Right? So the green. These are the green canonical tensors. <coughs> this is the new result. And then I get the green conservation laws. The green conservation laws. And the green one is here exactly the same. No, with one exception. I have here a E, and here I have a EI. This is perhaps not a big surprise. And then I should also have here a E, which I forgot in my manuscript, I just noticed. Here. But this equation becomes different. And uh, it's straightforward algebra for that reason. I don't show it. Um, it is EI. And this is a bit surprising. It's inside, it's not surprising, but uh, E of T alpha I. And this was equal to zero in special relativity. But in gauge theory, it is unequal to zero. We get here a torsion piece, torsion. If I'm happy that I have here this B and that I can tell torsion, um, alpha I beta <coughs> times E times energy momentum E beta I plus a curvature alpha I beta gamma times E times S beta gamma I. Okay. And incidentally, uh, Carton, in uh, 1923, he guessed that this has to be zero, which, which is true in three dimensions, but not in four dimensions. In four dimensions, you have these terms. And so he forgot these terms, and for that reason, this whole theory uh, went down the drain. Um, and so these are volume forces. They are like Lorentz forces. We have here uh, a field strength times a current. This is a translational field strength 
times the energy momentum current. This is the rotational field strength times the spin current. Uh, in, in electrodynamics, we have the field strength times the electric current, F, H, J. Uh, and so these are Lorentz type forces. And in, in a case theory of gravity, Lorentz type forces. You, you have uh, no longer a zero on the right hand side, uh, but you have this uh, right hand side. Uh, in the end, what you end up with, you end up in a Riemann Cartan space. And we have already uh, uh, looked into some of the features of the Riemann Cartan space. So in uh, number 404, I now want to uh, get the field equations. That's three, that is four, four. Four, four. Field equations. Of shear line cable. Okay, now what we, what we do is, of course, we take the total Lagrangian, which depends on the metal Lagrangian, which we modified by aging, and we add a gravitational Lagrangian. And this gravitational Lagrangian um, is, is we take the curvature scalar, as we already announced. So this is E, the determinant of the tetrad, which is, this is where usually in metric theory of square root of minus determinant divided by two times the gravitational constant times, I, I write down how this looks like, the curvature scale of E, I, uh, alpha, E, J, beta, which is just a contraction of the curvature tensor, R, um, J, I, alpha, beta. You see by this, uh, we just contract these indices, so that is the curvature uh, tensor, and we can add uh, uh, cosmological constant times the determinant plus our metal Lagrangian L, which was a metal Lagrangian, which we had was depending on the commas, on the metric, on the, on the first derivatives uh, of the psi minimal recovery. Okay. And now uh, the, the independent variables. Variables are of course the gauge potentials E I alpha gamma I alpha beta and psi the metal field. So we get two field equations for parity and one uh, for meta. And now I have the exercise one for students. I've always had one student who made exercise number one. Prove that the variation of, uh, we have here the variation if the i is down and the alpha is up. But we can also define a variation uh, in the other way around, which is often very convenient. So delta E K beta, which is proportional to minus variation of delta I L, uh, E I L, move this. There is a, a minus sign between variation of the frame or the variation of the co-frame. And the exercise number two, which is also straightforward but needs a little bit of index chucking, is an equation which uh, uh, looks very nice. If we vary the curvature tensor, and the curvature tensor depends only on the gamma, not on the metric or anything. It's only on the gamma. In, in a gauge theory, uh, in the riemann cartan space, uh, I alpha beta, where is my formula? 
alpha beta used. That is equal to two times the gauge covariant derivative by the curvature. It's nothing but the gauge covariant derivative of the variation of the connection. The variation of the connection in contrast to the connection is a tensor. And this is a, so it's a tensorial quantity. And so you can express the variation of gamma directly in the variation of gamma. You have just here to take uh, care of this. Uh, this uh, you can move by uh, tensor algebra and this is your duty uh, or your pleasure uh, or both you and your pleasure and if you do that then you uh, have just a few equations we, we substitute that here you get by variation with respect to B you get R beta alpha times <coughs> Um, uh, beta alpha I beta, which is a Ricci tensor because it's connected with respect to these two indices, minus one half E I alpha, and here we have the scalar R beta gamma, gamma beta, minus cosmological constant times E I alpha, I think it's a plus, no a minus. And this is equal kappa um, uh, 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 energy momentum and uh, the corresponding quantity E alpha beta i minus delta i alpha T so alpha beta, here i, here alpha, then here a beta, gamma, gamma, minus, it has to be anti-symmetric in alpha and beta, uh, so it has to be a plus, delta, beta, b, alpha, gamma, gamma, and this is equal kappa times the spin alpha beta, these are the variation of gamma, the variation with respect to psi gives you the Dirac equation if you take a Dirac Lagrangian. So these are the equations of Einstein, uh, of Schirmann, Hegel. <coughs> Gravitational field equations. <coughs> and of course, these are 16. <coughs> partial differential equations and these are 24. <coughs> but one can show that this anti-symmetric piece of here, because it's related to this equation, does play a role if the second field equation is fulfilled. I call this sometimes the first and the second field equation. <coughs> Clearly this is of the Einstein type and clearly this is, of course, a new equation which was uh, uh, originally derived at this time for the first time. I wanted to uh, speak a little bit about <coughs> the uh, critical density. Uh, I just leave it with a remark. And I also wanted to I did down in Excel calculus, but this is done in the book, which I'm always referring to. And in my last lecture, um, I will uh, develop that in formalism uh, systematically, I mean mathematically, for uh, riemann kalman space, for the case theory, and uh, will derive the most general Lagrangian which we use today <coughs> in these two uh, hours which are left. But here I want just to add <coughs> one remark, and this is basically 405. 
critical intensity. <coughs> there is, if you have a particle number density n, density is of course n times n and the spin density is, um, uh, is um, h bar is the fermion r over n times n. Now in the Einstein pattern theory you can show <coughs> in decomposing this tensor that uh, you can decompose it in a symmetric part and in the rest, and the rest you can express with help of this field equation in terms of the spin. And then you can uh, find out that in einstein kaplan theory, this symmetric tensor Pij is equal to the corresponding one in general relativity, plus you get correction terms kappa, the gravitational constant, times minus 4 s i k delta symmetric l times s uh, j l k anti symmetric plus etc there are altogether uh, five terms the, the, the essential thing which i want to show is only sorry that uh, there are spin quirl terms. So if the, and there are kappa times spin square. So you have, if you want to compare the contribution to the mass with the contribution to the spin, and if they have to be of the same order, then uh, rho has to be kappa times s square. This is the S square, the spin square, kappa is the gravitation of field strength, and this is the O from here. And this you can just um, um, uh, uh, determine, and then you find that the density where the einstein kaplan theory sets in, and where the spin square terms dominate over the uh, O terms, is uh, at about m square over kappa h square. Oh, this is just what I have here. <coughs> and if you compute it, this is m, the mass of the particle you consider, a neutron or an electron, whatever, times the lambda Compton wavelengths times the Planck length square. So this is about 10 to the 54 gram per cc for neutrons. This is by far, I mean, in cosmology, you go, uh, the Big Bang has 10 to the 93, etc. And so if you if you go to the um, the radius where the einstein kaplan theory sets in, it's about the third root of lambda com neutron or electron, whatever you consider, times L square. And for the neutron, that's about 10 to the minus 26 centimeters. So that is uh, by far above the Planck length. The Planck length is 10 to the minus uh, 33. So the einstein kaplan theory, this is about unification, grand unification scale. And um, lately I have heard an, uh, uh, lecture by Mukhanov in, on, on the Planck data and he claims that he can in the Planck data go down and can verify general relativity up to this order of magnitude. He said 10 to the minus 27. Uh, uh, now if Mukhanov is right, then it's he can check GR up to about the length where einstein Kaplan would set in. So you see, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting and become interesting. And so uh, you have 
here some recent applications in cosmology by uh, three groups, which I just want to name. Can I just use it again? Two minutes? Okay. Four or six. Um, <coughs> recent applications in cosmology. I'm talking about Einstein Kappel theory, not about gauge theory and gravitation generally. Recent applications in cosmology. I just cite four groups, which, I mean, this started already when, when the theory was invented. 72 already people looked into cosmologies, but this was more like, uh, well, at this time cosmology was not a very, um, was not in very high regard, and people uh, took it with amusement. But now I just mentioned Poplavsky. He finds a balancing universe. And the balance is, uh, is induced by torsion. Then uh, is, this is 2012. I'm just uh, talking about recent applications by Mark Radio. And uh, 